Hi, I'm Mike McManus. I'm the Director of Precision Medicine at uh, Intel. And I'm joined here by two uh, collaborators. Um, the CEO of Clovertex, uh, his name is uh, Shidij Kumar and uh, Professor uh, Toshio uh, Maria. And um, before we get started, just wanted to say if you have questions, if we can hold them towards the end and just shout them out and uh, we'll deal with them. And if you have questions, like deeper questions, there's a session at two o'clock uh, here in Caesars Forum where you can come talk to us one-on-one -on -one and ask whatever you want. So before we get started, I had no idea like the audience composition here. So um, let's see if that worked. Come on. So yes, uh, I wanted to just explain what cryo-electron microscopy is. It's for those of you that know what it is, well, sorry. Um, for those of you that don't, maybe you'll find it interesting. But basically, um, on the slide here, actually I'll point this way, um, what it is is it's a method for going from say, a, a mixture of a protein of, of interest that's sitting in water, and you can't really crystallize it and use traditional methods to understand its three-dimensional structure, so you freeze it. That's where the cryogenic comes from in cryo. And then once it's frozen, you bombard it with a bunch of electrons and a beam that comes from a microscope, and that's where the EM comes from, electron microscopy. And you get a bunch of blurry images. And for those of you that remember what TV was like when things went off the air, it looks like static. But there's actually information in those images. And the software tools, there are several, take that data and convert it into a three-dimensional model. In this case, it's a spike protein from COVID-19 that you can manipulate with a computer. And then from there, you can go on and do other computational tasks. So that's what cryo-EM is first 30 minute section is about. So I've introduced these guys um, uh, again. So he's, um, he is from a company called, uh, she is just from a company called Clovertex, which is a, a combination of IT services cloud company. And uh, Professor Maria is from KEK. And we're gonna let them each talk about their company now. So um, she why don't you start? Thank you, Michael. Can I get the pointer here? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> myself, uh, Shitej Kumar, founder of uh, Clovertex. Very happy to be here with uh, Professor Moria and, uh, and Michael. Um, how many of you listened to the session in the morning, the keynote session, or attended it? Because I was very, very happy to see that there was so much focus in that session on high-performance computing as a, as a technology area, but then so much focus on drug discovery, multi-omics, healthcare. Because that's the area where Clovertex really specializes in. In fact, a lot of HPC services that they talk today, they came around 2018, 2019 timeframe. And at that time, those services were not what they are today. Some of them were very immature. Some of them were in a preview state. But that was a time when Clovertex started in 2018 with an idea that, hey, can we really reduce the drug discovery time to save the patient lives. It, it, it sounds like a very interesting statement, a very interesting moniker, but as technologists, what we can do? Like, it's a lot of science. Drug discovery is all about science, clinical trials and all, but can we provide enough of right kind of compute to the scientists? Keep the scientists shielded away from all the complexities of the cloud and infrastructure to help them focus on science. And little did we know that in 2020, we will actually see the results of that, unfortunately, through the COVID pandemic. So in 2019, <clears throat> we were engaged at a large pharma where we built their research platform in AWS using high-performance computing services. And in 2019, of course, we didn't know about COVID, no idea what's going to happen. And in 2020, when the lockdown happened, when COVID became a, like a global event, this pharma company was able to leverage their research cloud in the AWS be it getting several compute instances, hundreds of them, be it providing scientists lots and lots of compute clusters without having to wait in a queue. And they were able to essentially do their own drug discovery, treatment, slash vaccine for COVID. So that, that gave us a great confidence that, hey, you know what? We are trying to really build a company in that particular space. So since then, Clovertex is really known in the high-performance computing space. But 
we have started to look at other areas within pharma where we can essentially go and try to improve services. And not only that, over the years, we have done so many of these implementations for various pharma companies, trying to solve the same problem again and again, that we have built a drug discovery platform. So we really sit between the research and IT, where our scientists can talk the science language, and our IT engineers can talk the IT language. And we can essentially provide a platform to the scientists for that. So this platform today is more focused on structural biology, cryo-EM, but very soon we are going to essentially roll out genomics and multi-omics pipelines on the, on the same platform. Now when we think about a product or a platform, uh, there are two things which are very important. One is, how do you provide easy access to compute? Not only easy, the right access to compute, which requires a lot of benchmarking. So we'll talk about some of it today. And that's where we have been collaborating with Intel over the last one year to benchmark several instances in AWS across various workloads for a cryo EM. So instead of you having to experiment various instance types and try to figure out over months or a year what's the right price performance ratio, we can share some of our knowledge. And we'll see some of the results today. The second part is, how do you make the life of a scientist better? There was a chart that Michael had brought up when Michael was talking about the cryo EM. It was, it's a workflow that you go through. And a lot of the steps in those workflow are very manual steps that you have to take. And that's where we are partnering with KEK, who are focused on building workflows to automate those steps. And our idea is that, hey, if we can provide an easy way for scientists to get those optimized benchmark instances along with those workflows, it can really aid a lot of science for them. So HPC certainly is a, is a, is a key area for us. But like I said, we are getting into other areas as well. Some of them are listed here on the slide here. Uh, and when we talk about managed services, so whatever we build as high performance computing, we really manage that as well. And we have grown into other areas of managed services, including cloud managed services and database managed services, where for this one pharma, we are managing today thousands of databases, on-prem, AWS, all flavors of it. But the differentiator that we have is a lot of focus on automation. So when we talk about managed services or managing some instances, you always talk about L1, L2, L3 kind of support, where L1 are those routine tasks, L3 are those complicated tasks. And our motto is that, can we make that L1 as an automation? So within the first year of service at this pharma, we have been able to automate over 80 to 90% of the L1 tasks, which were done manually through now automation. So yes, it's not directly research, but it's still enabling an organization wide across to make the systems, systems up and running. So today in this talk, we'll talk about more around what kind of benchmarking we have done on various Intel instances for cryo-EM workloads. Now, I, yeah. I'll oh, pass great. it over to Toshio-san. No, I, I think that I can just talk, right? Yes. yes. Great, so then thank you. It was really great introduction myself too, so I don't need to talk too much. So I'm from Japan, uh, actually it's Scuba City near Tokyo, and our facility is called KK, and the English name is High Energy Accelerator Research Organization. Why KK? Because it's abbreviation of Japanese. Co-Energy Kasuki Kenkyujo. So it's a very strange abbreviation, but the KEK is very easy to pronounce, so we use KEK. And our facility is mainly for physics, so we have synchrotron about diameter of three, uh, zero kilometer, and it's one of the major synchrotron, and we have also the major facility for beam line facilities. And on top of it, that we have also the cryo EM facility, and this uh, facility is, is uh, open for the, uh, all the Japanese researchers in Japan uh, to, as a shared uh, research fa uh, facility. So main task for me is doing that the, the supporting these users and also that the, uh, developing the, the software for them. And uh, my own research is algorithm development for the single particle analysis, which is cryo EM data uh, analysis part. So the uh, organization is consists of two uh, major uh, research institute, which is particle and nuclear studies, and one is material structure science. And our facility is called, the, uh, my center I'm belong to is called the Structural Biology Research Center. And it's a very tiny portion of the uh, K, at KK because the biology, uh, biology is not like major uh, field in our research institute. 
but we do really that good effort. Uh, we, we have a, a very, very rich facility for the structural biologists. So uh, now that we have the uh, cryo EM facility, we have the Taos Arctica 200 kilovolt, which uh, we uh, run, operated about four years at this point. And then from this year, finally, we got Titan Krios G4, and it's a three kilo, uh, kilovolt, uh, one, uh, three kilo, uh, 300 kilovolt uh, uh, high end uh, cryo EM. And we are, uh, it's coming soon and open for the users. So this is, you know. Good. Yep, yep. Okay, um, so, so basically what we're gonna talk about next is um, Shiruji is gonna talk about some benchmarks uh, because, you know, people like benchmarks and uh, that show how um, rely on, which is the software that Intel has optimized on, um, for, for running on Intel CPUs, how it performed in their hands on AWS. Thank you, Michael. So if you know about CryoEM, right, in the last three, four years, that's a technology which has really come into light. A lot of farmers are trying to either use a CRO for the CryoEM data or they're building their own CryoEM labs. The challenge is these microscopes generate so much of data uh, terabytes of data, how do you securely take, you can certainly do it on-prem, processing which a lot of companies do, but how do you take this data securely in time over to AWS, store it, process it? And that's where a lot of these instance optimization really comes in. So here, what you see on the chart are three instances. We have done several of these, but for the purpose of the conversation, three instances that we are looking at. So let me, let me walk you through the chart, how it's set up. So on the right, left side, you have the runtime in hours. So when we are running a Reliant workload, how many hours is it taking? On the left side, you have the cost of it. Each blue bar represents how much time it took to process the data. So if you look at the first instance, which is a C6i8XL, that, that instance has 32 vCPUs. So when we run a workload on that instance, it took about 21 hours or so. The orange box is the price per instance. So that costs $1.36 per hour in AWS. This is not a price, this is the direct, if you get an instance on demand, that's the price that is here, okay? So orange line shows you that, uh, that orange box shows you the price per instance. And the line on the top that you see shows you the total cost for running that workload. So looking at our example here, the six, C6i8XL took 21 hours and it costed $28 to process that. The next instance that we looked at is a C524X large, which is a 96 vCPU. The cost is $4 some cents. It took seven and a half hours to process for $29. And the last instance that we have here is the C6i32XL, which is a 128 vCPU instance. The most expensive instance here, which is $5.40 or something, and took about five hours to process that data. Now looking at this, right, if I'm a scientist, if I'm trying to pick an instance and these three are presented to me, my, I would gravitate not to look at the C6i32XL, oh, it's a $5 instance, it's very expensive, I'm going to go with something cheaper. Michael, if I may have the yep. clicker. Yep. Yeah. So I will go with something cheaper. But if you see the results, okay, the C6i32XL costed the least to finish that workload. It costed $27 to finish. It finished sooner also. Yes, the price per instance is high, but to finish the entire job, it was much faster. So your overall cost was cheaper. So that's, that's the power of benchmarking, right? That is there, that can be leveraged. And like Michael talked about, this is the Intel optimized version of Reliant. And Reliant is a, the, I would say, the most pre predominantly used open source software in the cryo EM space, right? So the key point is that the instance with the lowest hourly cost leads to a higher processing time. Now, looking at this scenario, right, you can think about we, along with Intel, we can share this knowledge with you to say, hey, you know what, you may want to evaluate this, or you can learn on your own. So there are several like, options like this which are available, which have been benchmarked, which we can really bring to it. And that's one thing which our, the, the product I talked about essentially does is, hey, gives, based on your workloads that you have, it can make you that recommendation. Hey, based on your workload, how much time you want to process, we recommend XYZ instance. We recommend XYZ cluster. Now, you may decide to use it or not, but at least you have a guidance which is available to you, right? So the result is that 
that your job is at a lower cost, okay, and it's two hours faster. If you compare the instances between C524, which is seven and a half hours, and five, and five hours between C6, keeping the, the 32 vCPU instance aside, because that's taking a lot of hours, is that you essentially have an instance which is 33% higher in the cost, okay, but it's faster. It's 7% faster, but the 7% adds up when you, th when you think about doing these workloads, right? Several times in a year, and multiple scientists are doing. So this, this plays a huge role in your overall cost, how you look at, uh, look, look at your cost for the infrastructure, and from the scientist's point of view, how fast can they process, and how many structures can they process? There are so many scenarios where you get the data out of cryo-EM, it runs for hours and hours, you start getting the data, you look at it and you realize, oops, these are not the right settings, I have to restart. So you may have to go back and restart with different set of parameters. So the amount of iterations and repetitions that you have to go through makes these things, uh, these small numbers, really add up to something, something which is large. And, and that's the work which we have been doing with Intel for quite some time to benchmark new instances. Today, AWS announced a lot of other instances will go and basically start benchmarking on them to see how those workloads really, uh, really look like. So a, a very, very valuable exercise, which I think is a good thing to share. Right. Okay. So it's uh, my time. Okay. So, uh, uh, or I can change yeah. for you. Go ahead. Thank you. So the, uh, we also do the benchmark at the KK. And the reason why we started developing the AWS is a user support, which I forgot to tell you guys. So the, we have about 50 group of the uh, 50 research group uh, we are supporting, and the 10 of them are industrial users. And for that, that many of them just started uh, uh, using the cryo EM because that, uh, since we have the uh, X-ray crystallography facility, many of the users that uh, we support are crystallographer originally, and then they started using cryo EM. Uh, however, uh, relatively, the cryo-EM uh, requires a, a, a high-end machine, and it's not that easy to uh, uh, get the access to the uh, machine. Therefore, that, uh, we wanted to support uh, these users uh, more uh, easily and cheaply, so that we, uh, we decided, okay, maybe the public, uh, uh, public cloud might be a really good idea to uh, use. So we started developing it, but one of the concerns was people always ask me how fast and also how much it will cost. Therefore, we started doing the benchmarking uh, so that we can uh, tell that the, how much it will cost and how much that the, 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 uh, the speed up that you can expect it. So uh, because we are doing the uh, analysis uh, daily, uh, we use a, a real uh, data set, which is actually uh, this nitrogen uh, redux data, which we process and reach to the 2.885 Ongstrom resolution. And uh, this one is showing only 2D classification result, but we did also the benchmark with 3D uh, refinement, 3D classification, and polishing, if you know. So there's uh, many other different uh, processing that which we, we need to do the benchmark for, from the, uh, the software for the cryo EM, but this is just one result. Okay, so the x-axis is a type of the benchmark, uh, mainly it's a machine type, and y-axis uh, uh, left side is runtime. And uh, the right side is a cost, processing cost, means that how much it costs to process this particular data set with 2D classification. So uh, before we started working with uh, uh, the Michael and the, uh, sorry, <laughs> and uh, uh, so the, uh, we did our own benchmark and uh, tried to uh, compile the reliant with the optimal setting. And uh, this is the leftmost side is showing the 1.62 hours and $59. And uh, this was very, very expensive for us. So we decided, okay, maybe we have to optimize more. And then that the, at the beginning, we used a C5 instance. 
And then that the, the Amazon uh, people uh, recommend us to use a C6i, so we started using it, but we couldn't reach to the, uh, we couldn't get any improvement much. Then that the, the, uh, the we got advice from Intel engineer that uh, maybe that you can change the compiler setting. So we changed the compiler setting. So this is a uh, uh, new one. So the yellow one is new X core. And the old one, we used to use the X column setting. And then we got a uh, significant improve here. So the price, beca uh, the cost became 60 to 30 dollars. So 50% reduction. And also the uh, processing time. Then on top of it, we, the, the Intel engineer uh, the recommended to uh, change the MPI and thread setting, which is a parallel setting for the, uh, our, the software that we use called Relion. And then we got another uh, about 30% reduction, I think. That uh, again, so the, what we think is key point. So using the right compiler flag can be shortened the runtime and raises the processing cost. So this is very important, we figured out. And the result is that basically using X core instead of the X column. And uh, yeah, it says it provides 3.4 times faster runtime and 3.7 uh, lower cost. Means that the actual cost and the uh, time uh, linearly uh, as, as a correlated Right, the improvement of the cost and runtime. Then the the uh, the third point is that using MPI thread and all virtual core uh, versus less MPI thread and mostly physical core yields the shortest time and lowest cost. Means you also have to pay attention for the how to run the program. So this was a really great opportunity for me to collaborate with Crobatex and Intel, and we are very thankful for them. Thank you. So I, I think that might be our, our last slide, but it's, this is an important point. I mean, as someone who is a longtime user of AWS from my past um, company before I joined Intel, I, I, I saw firsthand the movement of data from an on-prem system or, or workloads from an on-prem system to the cloud being done rather haphazardly. And people not fully understanding that even though underneath it all, they're all racks of servers, the way in which you interact with the cloud um, is often different than the way you interact with you know, an on-prem system. And that you need to just be sensitive to that. Don't blindly port your code, but rather be thoughtful about how you do it. And some of these uh, compiler tunings and price estimation things are, are important because, as you know, in an on-prem system, the costs are kind of somewhat non-obvious. And in the cloud, everything's got a cost associated with it. So thus, there is a lot of emphasis on what do things cost when I run them in the cloud. And that cost is somewhat hidden in these on-prem systems. So, so knowing the difference between them is important. So I, I don't know if there are questions for, for these two gentlemen or, um, oh, yes, and I'll repeat it if you want. How are you transferring this enormous amount of data between Microsoft and AWS? How long does that take? Is there a latency? Uh, and then what about the user interface for the user who's capturing the data to get it from the instrument into AWS? OK, um, so I'll just repeat the question. He's asking, how does the data get and I'll paraphrase a little bit, from the microscope, say, to the cloud, how do the users figure out how to do this? Like, what, what's the mechanism? And, and so, you know, Thermo Fisher, you know, which is the major provider of these microscopes, you know, has this camera that sits inside the microscope, and it communicates with a server that sits outside the microscope, and it moves image files, or not image files, movies, typically, one gigabyte movie files, and I'll, you can ask me later why, why they're movies. And, and then those movie files get converted into image frames, and then those image frames are then moved to the cloud or moved to the on-prem cluster. Uh, so depending on who you interact with, there are national centers uh, and um, commercial providers. That, there's one in, um, in New Jersey that services a lot of the pharmas that will send the data right to an S3 bucket for you from the microscopes. And then there are some um, that are on-premise 
inside of pharma, and they will either move the data to Amazon or they'll move it to an on-prem cluster. But data movement is a tricky issue, and um, you know, often the connections between different entities is difficult. Like you can have AWS Direct Connect to have a 10 gig connection, but you can saturate that pretty quickly with 600 one gig movies an hour. Um, and, and so it's, you, have to be, you have to be thoughtful about how you do this. Michael, if I yes. would. Uh, is it okay? Yeah, so of course. The, we, we have data for that. So to, uh, to send the Tokyo region from KK, Tsukuba, uh, we have a connection called Signet, which is dedicated for the academic and research uh, usage. And uh, one terabyte took uh, three hours. So, so, say that again? One terabyte, uh, three hours. What I, would, what I would share is that uh, for our clients, they have a direct connect between their uh, lab or the organization to AWS. And almost all the time, we are using the data sync service to move the data or some non-AWS services like Veka to, trans to transfer the data in that area. So there was a time when uh, the live option on the cryo EM was not there, which essentially allows you to look at the data as it's being almost generated. So you can make a correction, stop the microscope. So how you move the data for non-live is slightly different how you do for live. So like Michael talked about, right, the data comes from the microscope, goes to a server. From that microscope server, it goes to some on-prem storage. So we pick it up from that storage using data sync over to AWS. And what we do is that we are not waiting for the entire experiment to finish. We are picking up the data as the microscope is running. So there is no longer than, let's say, an hour of latency from the time the microscope finishes to the time a scientist can start the work. Now, in the live scenarios, we are picking up the data right from the microscope PC. And within five minutes of the data being generated, it's available in the cloud for you to do the live sessions on that, uh, on those, on, on that set of data as well. But it is something which needs to be benchmarked, tried, and like Michael said, you can completely saturate the entire pipe with this thing. So we have to work with the network teams to make sure that we are giving it the right kind of bandwidth for this data to, to go across. Any other? It's hard to see. Any other questions? Or? Oh, uh, OK. Yeah, two people. Uh, well, yeah, um, we use, uh, he can talk about it too, but FSx for Luster is used, uh, Weka has been yep. tried. I don't think we have Barris here in the front rows doing a lot of that work with um, his colleague Shiva, um, Shiv. And so um, that hasn't been shown here, but it's in process and we could probably talk to you offline about more details if, you, if you're interested. But yeah, parallel cluster and, and a parallel file system together are an, a much more optimal way to process the data because of the high, you know, I/O and it's, that's required in, in parallel. And so, for, um, so, for, so like Michael was saying, right, that you said the data goes into S3, and then it's essentially mounted using FSx onto your instances. It's processed, and then it's basically saved back. The results are saved back into the S3. Um, and that's how we're getting the parallel file system luster to do all the processing on it. Yeah, so actually, if you want to stick around, um, Brendan um, from Sention will be talking very soon. And so that might be a better question for us to address once he's up here, if, if that's OK. I think we're just about out of time for this segment. Was there one more question? Over there. I'm sorry, I can't see. Uh, yes, go ahead. A veer versus luster. I don't know um, if we've done that. Uh, no, no, we have not. Yeah. I don't know if, if Toshi. No, no, no. no. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just luster. Yeah. A yeah. lot of clients tend to miss. They, there are other options available, but they tend to stay 
more AWS native because those services are just more easily integrated. But I know our clients are using Aware in other places for a lot of backups and data movement and all, but not in the CryoVM space. Okay, yep. Uh, we, we do. We just, um, because this show, we've asked not to, been asked not to present anything um, competitive. We, we've avoided that discussion here. If you want to talk about those things, um, come to our session at two. It's a, you know, we can talk one on one, and, um, and actually, some of the folks in the front row have done a lot of that work and can yep. talk to you. Yep. So I think we're pretty much out of time. So, what I'd like to do is thank um, Shidij and and Toshio, and um, have uh, Brendan come up and join me. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, you both. Much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good job. Thanks. Hey there. Hello. Welcome. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So um, let's see. What's the next slide here? Oh, there you are. Um, so I actually, um, Brendan's going to tell you a bit about Sention and um, and maybe then get back to uh, this gentleman's question um, once we once we get to that so I'll just have you jump right in sure yeah um, yeah thanks everyone for coming also thanks for the earlier presentation at Clovertex uh, that's very exciting and you know maybe we'll be working with you guys as well um, Sention is a um, kind of a pure software company we're a bioinformatics company that makes you know, self-contained binaries that work great on Intel, and we send that to the customer or integrate with, um, you know, AWS directly or um, partners also with AWS like Clovertex where, you know, they're running our tools in their system. So th the bottom line is um, if you're doing NGS data processing, um, you can use our tools um, wherever you want to do the compute, basically. Um, and a couple other nice things are we're fully sequencer agnostic. So traditionally, Illumina has been the primary um, you know, genomic data generator. Um, and we've been working with that data for about seven years. Um, and then we also have a lot of partnerships with the new sequencers. Um, there's been a lot of exciting announcements in the field. Um, I think there's at least four sequencer announcements this year um, from places like PacBio. Um, Oxford Nanopore continues to improve their chemistry. So those are the kind of the long read segment. And we have tools for that, as well as um, the other short read tools like Ultima Genomics, um, MGI, BGI, which is supposed to be available in America, I think starting Q1 this year. And then the, obviously the Illumina machines. Um, so if you're doing any kind of NGS data processing, uh, we have a solution for you. Also, it's important, uh, a little bit about that, the question about NGS benchmarking is a big thing that matters is just what um, kind of application or software you want to choose that can change, you know, the kind of underlying software like Sention or other alternatives will really determine um, the compute cost the most. And I say that because Sention is really designed to work well on kind of any Amazon instance. It's all compute optimized, so it's the, you know, it's the commodity Intel hardware that's um, with low RAM requirements. We only generally need um, 16 gigs of RAM um, for the variant calling portion. So it's, you know, you can do it, you know, extremely um, cost effectively across kind of any of these family of instances. And then similar to what um, Clovertex was showing, you know, you'll have the bigger the instance you use, the, you know, faster it gets done. But especially for leveraging the spot market, um, you can choose different um, families that may be available, right? So it might take Instead of taking 30 minutes on the latest, or 20 minutes even in the future on the latest, um, you know, Intel server, it might take three hours, but that had better spot availability. So it really is a super flexible tool that will kind of take the most advantage of your hardware. Um, and I know we'll have some slides later. You want the next one or? Oh uh, no, that's okay. Um, we'll have some slides later about a little bit of the timing, but in general, the cost is around 80 cents to do a 30x genome from FastQ to VCF in Amazon if you're leveraging the spot market. Um, Actually, I'll put that up if you want. Yeah, yeah, if you want to. We could go back to. Um, Hello. Come on. Um, so this is some examples, right? So these are, you know, the runtime is, you know, 36 minutes or an hour 
um, or two hours, um, but, and the cost is gonna be similar because we're utilizing the CPUs, so it's really up to you and what your needs are. Um, and we can also distribute it, so if you wanted it to go even faster, you can. Um, and this is also, you know, the C CPUs keep getting better over time, right? I know we're also, there's also um, big, you know, federal investments in new, you know, CPU chips and, and whatnot to get that going. So as the CPUs get better, as the instruction sets um, get better, we update our software as well. So this has gone from, um, you know, the similar data processing needs that used to take maybe five hours on AWS down to now this 30 minutes or so. And that's for the a full genome. And then obviously if you're doing an exome or a tumor normal pipeline or a tumor only pipeline, or uh, we're getting a lot more single cell applications now. Um, our tools work for really across these genomic applications. So as if you're basically, if you're generating um, sequence data, be it a long or short read, and it's you know, DNA, RNA, um, germline, somatic, all of these, we have kind of a, a broad um, suite of tools that you can use and build for whatever you need. And we also have pre-assembled pipelines for obviously uh, major use cases. I mean, maybe you should talk about a little deeper about the sequencer agnostic uh, point because you're kind of leading to that. Yeah, um, yeah, we could go b back to the first slide maybe too. So um, it's in the sequencer agnostic world. It's all also each um, pipeline, we have like custom uh, machine learning models that we've trained for each sequencer type. So um, if you have your Illumina sequencer or your, for example, Element Biosciences or MGI, these are all very similar data types, but they all have slightly different um, error profiles or um, you know, systemic differences in their sequencers. They're all trying to give you the most high quality, you know, 150 base pair reads that you can get. Um, but there, there's slight differences there. And so we have um, done some very robust machine learning model um, training with those data sets. And so each sequencer has its own uh, machine learning model. And that in this case, they're very similar. <laughs> but in other cases, like for PacBio, we have you know, the world's most accurate PacBio, um, small variant calling and structural variant calling. Uh, we would also have that for Oxford Nanopore for structural variants. We haven't released a small variant calling for them yet. Um, but these are all enabled um, with pipelines that are specific for these sequencers. Um, another interesting thing is that we have enabled um, joint calling, and you could actually do this across the different cohorts if you'd like. Um, but either way, we've enabled kind of the machine learning enabled joint calling, which is a new feature that we just released um, a couple weeks ago. Um, I don't know if there's any other points here. Well, the combination of read types. Yeah. In, in the joint calling. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Um, we're, we're st I'm still looking for a customer to do that. Uh, or we have a couple of people who are very excited about this to do it, to say, look, we can call, um, for example, Illumina, Illumina data with MGI data, right? They have both of those cohorts going, um, or they have both of those, you know, for whatever reason, they're sequencing on each of them, and they want to have it as the same cohort. and. Um, our expectation is that they're going to be happy with the kind of joint called results, but it remains to be seen. But usually, when um, you know the Sentian engineering team uh, says that that should work, it it does. So so that'll be pretty cool. Um, and then um, another point is the performance rate. So when we're getting this improved accuracy, there is no um, performance trade off, right? It's not like to get the better accuracy with the machine learning. Um, you know, it's gonna cost you more on Amazon, it's gonna be a similar cost, and that is that, you know, less than a dollar in compute cost in the spot market, and that two to three dollars in the on-demand world for a 30X genome, and then that scales up or down um, depending on the data. Good. Obviously, bigger or smaller. <laughs> I, um, maybe, um, did you wanna answer, do you wanna ask your question again? He, saw, he answered it for you? Okay. Um, are, are there other questions people have? Sorry. Oh, yep. Can you repeat that too? Yeah, the, uh, the question was what do we use um, for the pipeline workflow? So there's a lot of different workflow management tools. Um, so we uh, initially released the, like the Unix, Unix style 
binary where each piece of software is modular. Um, but then obviously our customers or us stitch it together however they want. So we support, right now we're working on Whittle. We work with a lot with Whittle, NextFlow, and SnakeMake um, ourselves. And then our customers can use whatever they want. Different, um, especially like managed platforms on Amazon, use their own, um, you know, they typically have like a preference. And then our customers, um, it's hard for me to say they have any specific preference, right? They're using all kinds of different things or even just from like basic scripts as well, depending on how complex um, their pipelines are. Uh, other questions? Okay, I'll give, give you guys some time to think. You wanna, I think the next slide is just kind of a, a key takeaway. Yeah, I think um, something to keep in mind again is it's really like an accuracy without compromise. Um, there's a lot of latent issues in Bonformatics. Um, there's some other, um, like when our customers are going f migrating from like an open source BWA GADK uh, to our tools, we also we have kind of more accurate tools where there's machine learning involved and it's trained specifically for specific data types. But we also support a variety of open source tools where, you know, the results are to the version supposed to be the same. So it's saying, you know, if I'm running BWMM and Mutec two version, this version, or the corresponding Sentian ones, the difference is just we'll have a dramatic compute cost reduction. So in general. Um, we're five to 10 X more cost effective than the open source tools. So that's a reason um, people license our, the software from us uh, versus just using an open source tool is the direct Amazon savings that are you know, quite substantial. But there's also just better usability in terms of um, you know, thread processing. So all of our tools are automatically scaled to as many cores as needed. So like as Intel releases bigger and bigger machines, we can just take advantage of that um, and then, you know, Amazon makes the bigger server you, you know, you use on AWS, the less kind of per flop it costs. Um, but you can scale up and down with that. But we also um, have written the software to be very um, consistent. Like we've, we've won the, the only consistency challenge award uh, given out ever in the industry, which means if you take the same data and push it through the pipeline, the results are the same. And that's caused by um, first, there's no downsampling. So a lot of tools to improve the kind of compute power and not have their like memory blow up or something will only look at a subset of the reads and just kind of call it good. They'll say, and that's, that's the downsampling. So if, if you're downsampling at 500 reads, it means anything over 500 um, they don't look at. And so we don't do any downsampling. And as you're, you know, like Michael was saying, a different, um, like the difference between a local cluster um, and Amazon is you can have all of these different amounts of threads that you might be using, right? And so some tools have a thread dependency as well. So if you were to run it on a 10 core machine or a 36 core machine, you know, that data gets, th gets sent to those different threads differently and then we'll have slightly different results and our tools don't have that. So pretty much ours is the only solution I'm aware of that's kind of independent of the read order, independent of, um, you know, Basically, if you have the same data input, there's nothing you can do to that data that will create different results on the outside. And I think uh, maybe 10 years ago, that was, as I'm a, a, also originally a biologist, so 10 years ago, I think biology is noisy, right? So people are like, oh, well, you know, it's like this is kind of close enough. But as we get, um, but in computer science, right, uh, people don't want, if you have the same data in and put it through the same pipeline, you should get two different results out. Right, like ever. So um, we kind of, uh, what my boss says, right, we want to enable the precision data um, for precision medicine um, versus, you know, having a little wiggle. And that's really a latent issue where, you know, someone might say, oh, that's, you know, that's been totally fine for me until, in, you know, if there's three million variants in the genome um, and you're only caring about specific variants that are causing disease or that are involved in your specific cohort, right, if that issue doesn't come up on those variants, you know, you don't know about it until it does. And then um, usually people are on, you know, like long sojourns kind of trying to track down this run-to-run um, -run difference that they don't even know exists um, and then uh, find us and are very happy. Um, that's also um, an example of the like CRISPR, right? So there's a lot of CRISPR applications where you're looking specifically, like you're taking, um, 
the CRISPR molecule and trying to make a specific edit in the DNA, and you're looking for off-target effects, right? And that's taken very seriously, especially as you know the, the field progresses and that's used for um, you know whatever kind of animal modification you don't want to be making. Um, you know, you want to be making your purposeful cuts and changes, but certainly you want to be able to track your non, um, like, like if, there's, if, they're going, if they're going anywhere else, right? And um, having a really consistent software um, is very important for that. Um, I don't know, Michael, do you have any other? I, I think you covered a lot of them. I mean, I, we have time left. So if there are questions too re pertaining to, you know, the past speakers, we could just, you know, you can still ask them and they can come back. So, or if you've got more for, for Brendan, then let, you know, let, let us know. Again, it's hard for me to see the hands. Any, any more questions for Brendan or anything for Clovertex and KEK that you guys might want to ask? Uh, yeah. Go. yeah, I'd be interested in knowing how you make the argument or when you're going in and talking to the research center, what are the types of arguments you're making to get them to push to cloud? Uh, well, I mean, in the, uh, so the, our, the question is, what are the arguments that people use to get customers to move to the cloud? So in my case with pharma companies, almost all of them are on AWS as well as on-prem. So that argument is already discussed and done. Um, for smaller companies, it, it, you know, it does come down a lot to perceived cost and like whether they can save money rather than managing their own cluster um, or even something as mundane as do I have enough power, can I get enough power delivered to where my cluster is or should I just go with someone like Amazon? So those, those are kind of silly, it seems like silly issues, but we've had one customer who couldn't get enough power um, and just said the heck with it and moved everything to Amazon. Of course, they did it kind of lift and shift, which caused them a lot of problems, which they then fixed, and now they're very happy. So there's a lot of issues here about moving. You can't be naive about how you move your data and how you move your compute. And so customers also need to be mindful of that. Brendan touched on some of that, actually. Come on up if you guys want. Uh, they also touched on that, uh, Toshio did from KEK. You can't, you've got to be sensitive to the fact that these are not identical situations. And as long as a customer's informed and understands this, then they don't come back and yell at you for suggesting you move to the cloud, right? It's important to have that communication with them. Yeah, and uh, this right. is very important uh, in Japan that uh, I have the same question. So why do we have to use the cloud? It's too expensive, right? But actually, the, to be honest, that the, the making supercomputer or a huge cluster and maintain it can be very expensive compared with AWS because it's not on demand. You have to buy. You have to spend a certain money. And also the, the life expectancy of the cluster, the public cluster, is not so long. So like every five years that uh, they have to renew it, right? So, and the Japanese government doesn't have tax money so easy, so you have to wait for the uh, tax money to be the shared. And uh, these are kind of problems so that many people can't wait because now that structural biology field, it's very competitive, right? So they don't want to wait for years just for to get the, uh, the reasonable the computa co com computational resources. So in this case, AWS can uh, help. So what we are uh, basically uh, uh, recommending is we should have both, right? Supercomputer, but also AWS like cloud. Right, so that's our kind of conclusion at this point. Yeah, I mean, just let me add too, the average refresh time we see at Intel is about four years, meaning they acquired processors four years ago, but we've released new ones since then. Amazon's grabbing them every year, right? Whereas you're using a four-year-old system before you maybe refresh again. So, so depending on your need and, and you know, having currency and the, with the latest processors may or may not be important to you, but that is another consideration people think about in the move or not to move. What I would share uh, on that note is for scientists, it's a science that matters. They don't care it is on-prem, next door, or in the cloud. Right? So talking about the benefits of AWS, and a lot of the scientists don't even know what cloud is really, right? That's, that's not something important to them. 
For us, it comes down to that, okay, on Friday night, you were running a certain command in your Unix terminal here. Over the weekend, now things are running in the cloud, you're doing exactly the same thing in the cloud, but it just happens to be faster, okay? So the use cases that we talk to them are more science-related use cases. As an example, right, someone talked about CryoSpark or Reliant, multiple versions keep coming out. How do you, at the same time, if you're on-prem, try multiple versions of the software to see, hey, should you upgrade or not upgrade to the next one? But in the cloud, you can do something like that, right? Access to newer compute resources. Uh, telling scientists, hey, each one of you can get your own cluster versus standing in a queue on-prem. There was a use case which we had where the scientists had to process some oncology data, like 20 terabytes of data on a shared cluster. It would have taken him four to six months to process that. Just because of the time slices, he would have been available, okay? Four days to build in AWS, 24 hours to process. In five days, at a cost of less than $10,000, everything was done. So those are the use cases that you have to talk through and let scientists talk to scientists in their language to see the, to see the value of it. That's, that's how it really happens. You can't preach science to, science to them. So keeping the science, scientist experience the same in the cloud is very important. So you hear about containers and this and that. Sometimes those technologies are good, Okay. But they can change a scientist's experience. You don't want that to happen. Yeah, I, and I just, um, I was gonna say, is we're um, sequencer agnostic, but we're also you know, location agnostic. We provide a Linux binary, and so we have customers that run both, right? Especially, um, you know, the vertically integrated Big Pharma is gonna have typically both, but when we see a lot of like newer biotechs, um, they'll typically be cloud first, and I think that's also a function of the engineers that they're hiring, right? Like as more and more people are trained on AWS and can use it, right? They're, and they're a new hire at a newly formed, um, you know, biotech company, then they're gonna start just right at, typically start in AWS, right? Versus um, build their own. I mean, obviously some people will still like start a new company and start an, an on-prem solution. Um, and that's, you know, usually maybe if they're thinking. It's less common. Yeah, but it's definitely less common uh, in our experience. And I think that's also just, you know, the previous um, employees who were like cloud manager or um, on-prem uh, managers, right? Like as they get trained on Amazon, it's like that goes both ways, right? But there's people who are, um, you know, trained on Amazon who've never even man managed a, a local one, if that makes sense. So I, I definitely see it. The trend continues to be, um, you know, more cloud usage. And a lot of biotechs, pharma are sort of born in the cloud. So for them, cloud is really the way to go. And like we are based in Boston with so much biotech around us. And a lot of those companies are directly uh, operating in the cloud. Yeah, so, yeah go ahead. Right, when you say supercomputer versus a regular computer, are you talking about accelerated? Yeah. Yeah, so, so we didn't talk about, we didn't talk about GPUs. It, 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 you mentioned, you thinking GPUs when you say supercomputer? Yeah, so, so GPUs, we didn't talk about them here, but they're fast, clearly. Um, one of the things about CPUs is they have a really good uh, TCO, total cost of ownership benefit. So they may not be in some applications as fast as a GPU, but they're often much cheaper. And so depending on the customer's need, if it's really urgent, they might run on a GPU. If they're cost sensitive, they might just run on CPUs, right? And in other cases, like in Brendan's case with Cention, the performance on for genomics pipelines on CPUs are equivalent to GPUs and FPGAs. In that case, in the cryo-EM space that we're, we were, these guys were talking about, um, there are some performance differences, which we can talk about at, at the two o'clock session if you want. Uh, and it just, again, it comes down to preference, cost, and and. and I think it's an application, consider, like an application. Like, um, obviously, uh, GPUs like for for deep learning uh, applications are very you know popular um, for secondary analysis of genomics. Um, 
you know, our, our company can, you know, write the code in, or, or code for GPUs or FPGAs or CPUs, and we want to focus on what's most widely available um, so that it can be put in most people's hands, right? So, like I said, we can provide the software to people locally um, or in Amazon, and then um, that's what's also most widely available in the spot market, right? Like talking about latency and things like that. Um, you know, there's just so many different families of CPUs that the software runs very well on. And in terms of um, kind of like flops per dollar, the CPU, as long as you're using it well, right? Like when, if you look at um, profiling, right, of the, of the compute, right, we kind of are maxing out like 100% of the CPU power. So as long as you write it um, well for the CPU, it's just as powerful, um, if not more powerful, and, cer and certainly more cost effective. Um, Depending on what, depending on the application. So for our application, I'm obviously I wouldn't say I'm biased. I have the quantitative data, uh, but um, um, well, well, it just depends. I'll, I'm a biologist, so I'm not a. <laughs> I'll just say I wrote code too badly, um, but, but <laughs> as a scientist, I wrote it for what I needed to do, and a lot of the code you see out there that's being run on large scale started that way, and that's why Intel's been doing a lot of code optimization to show that when you optimize the code and, run, and sort of reorganize it properly, it's super performant. Mm -hmm. but, but we all started from, well, Fortran for me, because I'm older, but um, we, all, we all started writing code and we just did it for our own use. And, but it's proliferated, and so knowing what code you're using, what it's written in, uh, and how to optimize its performance, not even changing it, but even deploying it, is another vector or, or axis you could follow. So it's, it's, it's tricky, right? But obviously supercomputers are really um, attractive from a, a, a story point of view. Uh, and, um, but these are, the CPUs are really the workhorses. Right. So the, in science field, uh, for, for my field, it's very beneficial to have a different options because when you are developing software, you want to check with different uh, uh, hardware, especially there's tons of open sources some of them are good at the CPU, some of the uh, group are good at the GPU, and we want to check it, but uh, if it's on promise, uh, it's very difficult. And supercomputers are often uh, dedicated for some specific field, which is supposed to be, in my opinion, to be optimal. And uh, so the AWS is really nice that uh, you, know, you can try it out, many different kind of configuration uh, with many different software. Did that answer your, sorry, a long answer, but hopefully. <laughs> Any other? I think we have two minutes left, um, and then we've got to quickly exit for the next yeah. one. So let me make sure I, I'm having a hard time hearing you. So you want to know how we think about cost optimization? Exactly. Do, you, do you want to take that one? Um, I, I can say a little bit, like, again, um, to me, the, like, if you're just talking about I've got raw data from a sequencer and I'm turning it into a VCF in the secondary analysis space, that's where we are. It's really um, our software just deploys well on Amazon, and then, it, then you're using the most cost-optimized pipeline, right, if you're using the Cention pipeline because you know, you can do the, a 30x genome for 80 cents, an exome might cost four cents or something like that. Um, so if you're, it's, first it's what software are you selecting to, to do it with? Um, and then um, for us, the cost optimization is, it's pretty much done for you as long as you're putting on any Amazon, you know, CPU server, whereas, um, I don't know as much about like getting it to the cloud. I mean, there's a lot of sequencers are working on automatically doing that. Well, Amazon, I mean, um, Illumina's had a historically long relationship. If you've ever used um, you know, an Illumina sequencer, you can stream to the cloud. So they had base space, and now it's Illumina connected analysis. Um, but their idea there was to, rather than transferring a big file in one bolus, let's stream it as it's made and do the BCL to conversions there in the cloud and then to FastQ and then off to whatever pipeline you choose in Amazon. So that, that's how they've historically done it. 
Um, the idea of streaming data from an instrument to Amazon is still nascent, I think, because most of the data isn't actually produced in a way that you can start executing on it as it comes from the instrument, which is, I think, an area people have to work on so that you can actually, as you stream, start the, the analysis process. But that, that's a harder engineering problem. And again, we're talking typically about software that was never conceived of, never thought about doing it that way. But, but there are lots of things still to be done to optimize the movement of the data, how it's acted on, when it's acted on, that affect the cost. Uh, and so, well. I think that's it. I know it says oh, we're out of time. So I'm, a takeaway message you've seen, the CPUs are you know, useful. They aren't always the right solution, but they uh, shouldn't be excluded either, and you should evaluate them as you see fit. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.